Will Meadows, thank you so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from Chicago. You are an anthropology major at La Loya University in Chicago, specializing in biological anthropology. You're currently still on campus, but working online due to the pandemic situation. Uh, but no doubt you're looking forward to getting back to the actual classroom. Yes, absolutely. So I am definitely looking forward to getting back into the classroom. Online classes aren't terrible. I, I'm an audible learner, so it's not the worst for me. But um, it's really hard to be in a science, a physical science especially, and then not being able to touch or see anything um, in real life. So it's a little bit weird. But for my classes this semester, I decided to take more conceptual um, courses so that I was not missing out on the in-person experiences. Well, frequently on Evolution Soup, we hear from scientists and researchers, but we also like to speak with students such as yourself, not just as a way of exploring how evolution is taught currently, but also to encourage anyone out there who might be thinking about studying evolutionary science or indeed any of the sciences. Uh, but before we hear about your studies, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Now, you grew up in Seattle, and from the very beginning, you are fascinated by the natural world around you. Isn't that right? That's correct. I think it all started with my dad. Um, he was big into animals, so I had all sorts of pets growing up. Um, the most memorable ones were my two ferrets, and I had tons of dogs and cats, fish, lizards. I own two birds now, so I'm kind of making like the whole loop. Um, but besides like owning pets, I think the biggest influence for me was going out into the country, uh, Eastern Washington, which is more of like prairie land, and going horseback riding with my dad frequently. And we would come across decaying carcasses of like deer or wolves or bears, and we would always come across remains. And then it was just a game to my dad and I to see like, oh, what is this? What pieces of this skeleton can we look at to try and get information on um, what this really is. So the first thing that we would always do would look at the teeth, see if the teeth were oh, yeah. belong to a homodont, meaning that all of the, the same tooth shape is uh, there within the entire mouth, or if they're a heterodont, which means that they have different types of tooth shapes in their mouth, which is what we have. That just spurred into a massive... Um, just fascination with the natural world, everything living, breathing, alive, dead. I just wanted to know about all of it. Okay, let's talk about your university journey. You're a bioanth major, as we said, but things started out uh, quite differently, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, so I came into Loyola Chicago as a political science major. Um, growing up, my mom was very big into business, so she always pushed that on me a little bit. Um, and I thought I was interested for a while. I came in as a political science major because I was uneasy with the condition of where our country is at right now, and so I wanted to make a difference. I realized that there are other ways to make a difference than being a political science major, and I just did not like it at all. So when that didn't work out, I took my mom's advice and became an econ major, and that did not last very long either. I was so bored. Crunching numbers was not my thing. And so I took a history class, and I was fascinated by the section of that class that talked about prehistory. So all of the, the stuff that happened in the world before writing was invented, prehistory. And although that section only lasted maybe two weeks, I thought it was the most fascinating thing in the entire world. So I switched my major to history, thinking, oh, that's where I get this taste of prehistory. Um, it turns out anthropology is a thing, and so when I took a like a core anthropology class just to fulfill some requirement for Loyola, uh, it turns out that it was everything that I could ever dream of all in one major, and I fell in love with it instantly. Right. Studying evolution and biological anthropology opens doors to a whole host of amazing topics, and there are several particular ones that interest you the most. Perhaps most fascinating to you is human evolution and the study of homonyms. Will, what is it about the subject of homonyms that makes it so exciting? Um, I think growing up, I always questioned, like, what does it mean for us to be human? And although us as a species, and me as an individual, and you as an individual, we come from the same species, but at the same time, we are also our own individual people. 
And so this got me on this whole massive question of how did we get like this? And if I can't focus on the mental aspect, then I can focus on the physical aspect of how did we come through millions of years of evolution to look like the way we do now and looking at our past human ancestors and seeing the traits that look similar to what we have now and then seeing the other traits that got lost um, in the gene pool over time, I think is just absolutely fascinating. So what are your uh, your favorite hominins? Um, if I had to pick one, to if I could meet a hominin in real life, it would definitely be the Neanderthals. Um, I remember one of my professors telling me that a Neanderthal, if they were alive today and you saw them on the elevated train in Chicago, you would look at them kind of weird, but they wouldn't stand out so much for you to think that they weren't a human. And so I really, really want to be able to experience that myself. Um, unfortunately, I cannot. Besides that, I would probably have to go with Artipithecus ramidus just because of how fascinating the divergent big toe is. Um, yeah, me too. I'm <laughs> all the time. <laughs> um, it's one of my favorite hominins to talk about. I think that the collection of human appearing traits, like the spine and the pelvis, and non-human traits such as that divergent big toe and the very small cranial capacity, just make Artie fascinating. Because where does it really land? <laughs> yeah, and it's one of the earliest bipeds as well, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Well, you are also extremely interested in dental anthropology. What well, can you uh, tell us about that? Um, <laughs> I actually have my dental model right here. This thing is my absolute favorite. I always have it in my room with me. I was not expecting to be into dental anthropology whatsoever. I took the class because it was a 300 level class. So it's like probably, I guess it's the hardest I can take as an undergraduate. Um, and it was taught by my favorite professor at the university. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna take this class. Turns out I was pretty good at it. <laughs> um, and I just became really keen on being able to take an individual tooth and know exactly where in the mouth it came from. Not just what type of tooth it is, but is it from the left side? Is it from the right side? Is it from the mandible or the maxilla? I, I thought it was so interesting that there are so few people in the world that could do this type of identification that I sort of just wanted to be one of them. More on that, I did have a project in dent my dental anthropology class where I was asked to do a my own research question. So I was looking at two tribes that were in um, Alaska and I wanted to find out if I could look at the microware. So when we look for uh, microware under a microscope, we're looking for scratches, pit, uh, pits, um, dental caries, which are commonly known as uh, cavities, and these small um, markers on the tooth actually show us what type of food or substances our ancestors were chewing on or eating. And it's often seen in Neanderthals and early modern humans that teeth were mo like were often used as tools as well. And so you get a lot of really hardware on the front teeth, um, your central incisors, because people would grip onto leather while they were tanning the leather and they would use their tooth, they would use their mouth as like a third hand. And so I wanted to see if I could take the, uh, the microware and create some sort of a scale, I guess, to see if mm -hmm. microware leads more to this tribe compared to another type of microware leading more to this tribe. Unfortunately, um, Corona cut my research short, so I never got to actually finish the project. Um, but, uh, experiencing microware and looking at microware under a microscope was one of my favorite things <laughs> from my and of course teeth are, are one of the most the hardest wearing things around and they're probably the first thing you're going to find if not the only thing isn't that right oh yes absolutely enamel is the hardest biological substance on earth harder than a diamond actually the only reason that we humans can chip our teeth is because our enamel is so thin it is such a thin layer and it doesn't reproduce after the tooth erupts from the socket. So it just stays in your mouth. Whatever you have now is what you're going to have when you die. So the part, like the best part about the enamel is that since it's the hardest biological substance on earth, it also decays very slowly. So you will find in a site um, or an excavation site, you will find teeth way more often than you'll find actual bone. Um, and so being able to get as much information that you can off of teeth is crucial to understanding the whole context of this site that you're looking at or the people that you're dealing with. 
Yeah, there's so much you can tell from teeth. And I know that some detractors uh, will say that, oh, you, all you find is teeth, you know, but it's amazing what you can tell yeah. from not not just in terms of hominins, but, but any creature. Exactly. Along the same lines is osteology, the study of bones, another favorite of yours. So what can osteology tell us about our ancestors and about life in general? I think the biggest takeaway for me in osteology was that humans are a lot more similar than we actually think. So in class, we were asked to take our cadavers and try and distinguish age, race, and sex. This was a long process. Uh, I'm sh I don't know if you're familiar with the show Bones, but uh, featuring a forensic anthropologist who can identify remains in a heartbeat, it's not possible. Um, yeah. My favorite part about osteology in general is that if you are trying to decipher race, sex, or um, stature, I guess, there is only a certain percentile of confidence that you can actually have when you're making that assessment. And it only goes up to 98%. You cannot get above a 98% confidence because human, uh, human variation is so wide within our own species but at the end of the day, the similarities are way larger than the differences. So I just think it's kind of like a brain twister. Um, and then I also really love osteology because it helps a lot with my hominin research and trying to decipher if um, remains are bipedal or not. Different aspects of the body that you can look at or the skeleton that you can look at. First would be the foramen magnum, which is the foramen that is on the central aspect of your skull on the bottom and that's where your c1 um and c2 connect to so it's basically the hole that you see underneath <laughs> the skull. exactly and so when you're looking at a, uh when you're looking at a skull and you see that foramen magnum is centralized that means that the spinal cord was going directly down and it wasn't like having your head tilt up like a chimpanzee because they're uh, frame magnum is more at like a 45 degree angle instead of completely vertical. Another thing that you can look for is the shape of the spine. So if you can um, recreate your spine and it looks more like an S shape, then you're looking at a bipedal creature because of the S shape in your spine allows the center of gravity to stay above your feet so you don't fall over all the time. Whereas a chimpanzee has a C shaped spine because they are quadrupeds and they're always hunched over and that makes that's more comfortable for them in general. Whereas if we try and hunch over, it just looks weird. It looks awkward. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally is like the hips and the femurs. So if your hips are flared out and not very like tight together, if they're more like outwards, <laughs> I guess my hands aren't really a great example. Um, but that shows evidence of bipedality as well. Um, in chimpanzees, the uh, pelvis is very, very small, sort of like this. Um, and then in humans, the pelvis flares out. And that gives us a wider base at our hips and allows our legs to be a little bit farther apart. And then the final spot or the final part of bipedality would definitely be the femurs. So if you're looking at a femur and you put one end of the femur on a flat surface, if the femur goes straight up and is completely vertical, you're not looking at a biped. If the femur is going at an angle, as if the, um, I guess it'd be the proximal end, so the, the part that connects to your hips, should be wider than the distal end, which is the part that connects to your tibias at your knees. So you're actually creating sort of an arrow with your legs, which also helps with the center of gravity. When so, so you're saying the femurs angle downwards, which helps with keeping the center of gravity and standing upright. Exactly. And that's actually how um, Eugene Dubois was able to recognize uh, Homo erectus. But he found the head of a femur sticking out of the riverbank, and when he excavated it, he realized, okay, this is not a human femur, but it still has the same orientation as a human femur. Mm. So then that was his first giveaway that he was dealing with a biped. And you also love the principles of evolution in general. So why, in your opinion, is evolution an excellent method of understanding life and how life is woven into the world around us? I think that evolution or the theory of evolution gives 
answers to questions that honestly we need to have answers for. So in my opinion, the way that science works, I guess it's not just my opinion, but you create theories. Theories are agreed upon rules, I guess. And you make theories so that you can continue your research and move on from that, ori like that original topic. So without having the theory of evolution, we would still be stuck on the concept of did some higher power create us or did we somehow become this on our own? Um, and so I took it upon myself to just accept the theory of evolution and um, I'm in full support of it. And with that being said, that allows so many other theories to become true in my life. For example, Allen's rule, which states that individuals who are closer to the equator are going to have taller bodies, lengthier builds, and more often darker skin so that they can reflect um, the harsh sunlight. Whereas people that are farther away from the equator, let's say in the poles, are going to be much shorter, much stockier, so that they can retain their body heat and their skin tone is going to be a much lighter so that it reflects the sunlight instead of um, absorbing it. So you have two more years to go at Loyola University, and then the world is your oyster. So what are your hopes for the future? Uh, well, I mentioned earlier that I joined political science because I wanted to do something about the world around me. Now that I don't want to become a politician, I've decided to join the Peace Corps, actually. After I graduate, I want to serve in the Peace Corps for at least two years. Uh, potentially four, so that I can go on to get my master's degree because they have great benefits as well as I really, really want to travel the world around me and give back to people who grew up in environments a lot less fortunate than what I had. I grew up very privileged um, and there are so many people in this world who didn't get that experience that I feel like it's my responsibility to do something about it. Um, so after I spend my young adult years in the Peace Corps, I really want to move to Australia and work at the Sydney Zoo. Um, I would, I love animals so much. I think a zoo would be really, really cool. And I want to join a zoo so that I can personally make sure that the conditions for these animals are being met um, because it's very sad for me to look at mistreated animals. And so I feel like if I put myself in the scene, I can do something about that as well. And then finally, my main objective is to eventually get my PhD and write a textbook and start teaching at a university. Excellent. Well, this interview will be a way for you to reach out to young scholars who are interested in a career in science and unsure, perhaps sitting on the fence, not being able to decide. For any potential students out there watching this right now, what encouragement would you give them? Um, if I had to give encouragement for people on the fence, I would tell you to just listen to your heart and listen to yourself. Um, you know yourself better than anyone else does. And if you want to be a scientist and you want to do what you want to do, that's no one else's decision but your own. Um, and it can be very hard with the pressure of your parents or friends or peers or mentors. But at the end of the day, you're making a decision for your life and you get to live your life however you want to live it. That's <laughs> the pursuit of liberty, which we all talk about in the United States all the time, even though I don't think it's very apparent here. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it's all about you. You get to be selfish here. You get to make your own choices. You get to make your career decision. And it should be whatever fascinates you because this is what you're doing for the rest of your life. Will, thank you very much indeed for coming on to Evolution Soup and speaking so passionately about what you love. And hopefully we'll be able to catch up with you one day in the future. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to it.